you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to restart our intro in case uh, we got cut off or we weren't live yet. Um, so my name is Crystal Duhame, and uh, I'm here with my frequent collaborator, Mira Bertwin Tonic. Um, we've been working together since I want to say about 2005. Um, we both started on a show called Wiretap, which was created and hosted by Jonathan Goldstein. Um, it was a show through CBC um, and it centered on phone conversations that Jonathan would have with uh, friends and family. Um, there were also monologues involved, uh, comedy sketches um, and, and different kind of, it was, a, it was a very real blended format, I would say. And there was always a mix of fiction and nonfiction. Um, and then Mira and I went on to co-create Love Me, which is a CBC podcast. And so Love Me is, uh, it's uh, more of a personal storytelling show. It's uh, often non-narrated. So each episode consists of about two stories that are about 10 to 15 minutes in length. Um, we have a lovely host, Lou Elkowski, who comes in off of the top of the show to relay uh, a personal anecdote of her own. Um, and I would say that that the, the kind of thing that kind of qualifies most of our work, whether it be in comedy or more serious stuff or very personal storytelling is that it's always highly, highly edited and crafted. And so uh, we really kind of like to put in a lot of thought about not just what the stories themselves are and what the content is, but also like the negative spaces in between all of that content. Um, and I think that it's something that people don't tend to talk about a lot in uh, current storytelling. Like people always talk about how a story needs to move and there needs to be momentum, but people don't often take the time to talk about the actual pacing and the, the negative space in between. So we kind of wanted to take the opportunity to uh, use some of our work as an example and try to figure out what the patterns are and what it is that we're exactly doing with time. Yeah, and I guess when we got started on Wiretap, we kind of our first foray into thinking about uh, pacing and mixing and story, story timing was uh, through Jonathan Goldstein. And he had kind of learned his trade through by working at This American Life for a while. And they have these kind of established rules of like, every 90 seconds or so in a story, um, there should be like a six second music break, or at least at the time. I mean, this was 15 years ago or so however long ago it was and um you know so every 90 seconds there's like a six second music break that gives the, the listener a chance to just give their ear a break from the voice and um that they're hearing and you know sometimes you could push that to every 60 seconds there's a break or maybe every two and a half minutes but never longer than that there was all these kind of established like ways of just making sure you're pacing your story out um, between the voice and the information and the and the, and the music and just having these breaks um so that's kind of how we started learning how to make how to tell our own stories too and those rules are in general still something that you hear a lot today in podcasting and there's something that we still kind of keep in mind as as we're making things but you know over time we also started playing with those rules a little bit expanding uh, expanding things, breaking them a little bit, uh, thinking a bit more about pausing in a, and timing in a more flexible way. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, about just, yeah, breaking down your story uh, in terms of how it's, how it's unfolding and the timing and structure and rhythm and all of that. So the first clip that we're going to play is the opening from a piece called What Can You Hear? So it's from the last season that we made of Love Me. Um, it's a piece that we made with Lana Beck Sillison, and it's about a suicide prevention hotline in New York City that trains volunteers in a technique called active listening. Um, so the clip, the opening clip here is about a minute and a half long, and I would maybe suggest trying to listen through headphones if you can, because there's there are a lot of kind of subtleties in what's happening in the spaces. And I'm not sure if it'll come through in just your, your compute, computer speakers. Um, so let's try that. What can you hear? Strain your ears. Are they crying? Is there whimpering? 
as they blow in their nose. Learn to listen. Did they sound angry? Did they sound anxious? Were they nervous? Were they sad? Get out of your own head. Pay attention. Ready or not. So that's kind of, uh, I guess you would call it maybe a little bit of a prelude to a piece that is about 23 minutes total. Um, so we often like to think of the first scene in a piece as you're kind of setting the time signature almost for what's to come. So you're really kind of communicating to the listener through the sound cues, yes, but also through the pacing, uh, you're, you're kind of setting the tone of the piece. So obviously this is like a really, really slow rhythm. It's being really stretched out. So it's priming the listener for, for what they're about to hear. Um, and it's also setting the tone in that it's communicating that it's, it's gonna be a serious piece. It's not gonna be a light piece. And I think had we maybe, edited all of the voices to be coming off of one another a lot more quickly, it maybe would have set us up for something, a piece that was maybe a little bit lighter or perhaps more information driven. Uh, so we really wanted to give the listener the sense that they're going through this training program with the volunteers. So we're trying to really like communicate an experience rather than uh, just delivering information or trying to recount something. Yeah, so, yeah, it's so it's um, can you hear me okay? Okay, my internet's being weird. Um, yeah, so we're, you know, the, the beginning of a piece is like where you're trying to really set the tone, set the pacing. It's what, what preparing your listeners for what you're about to hear. So another, but another aspect of just the actual timing and rhythm in terms of like the spacing of words is just like the, the spacing of information and the reveal of information. Um, so how your timing is how, how your how information is being timed out or um, delivered little by little throughout the piece. So we wanted to play another clip um, that's from a piece that we made with a producer in the UK named Jody Taylor from our second season of Love Me uh, from an episode called The Other Side. I guess our relationship was quite normal. We do quite a lot of everyday things together. Get up in the morning, one makes coffee, the other one gets some breakfast. And if it was sunny, we'd sit outside and we'd have a favorite song that we'd listen to in the morning. And then I'd go off and do my job. He'd go off and do his thing and, and then come together again in the evening at the end of the day and told each other about the kind of day we'd had and what we'd done and who we saw and our shared space needed to be kept clean and tidy. So there was that, just domestic chores. Yeah, and then sometimes there'd be a very sudden reminder that things aren't normal at all. One time on a really beautiful, incredibly sunny day, we went for a walk on the beach just to get away from everything, the noise and the people, and just ran around in the in the sand, quite silly, <laughs> and sat down. And Tamim was kind of looking out over the sea and was pointing at the distant cliffs. And he turned to me and he was like, so, these cliffs over there, is that like some island? And I was like, no, that's, that's England. That's the White Cliffs of Dover. That's where you're trying to get to. And it was terrible. It was such a terrible moment. 
because it was so close and it was the most impossible journey and one of the hardest places for him to go but I can just go there and be on the other side in 45 minutes yeah he actually had to get up and walk away a few steps and just swallow that The Cali jungle, as the name already suggests, wasn't an authorised or planned camp. And with the refugee crisis that we've been seeing the last few years, the numbers increased very rapidly and went from a few hundred to several thousand people from all these different places. So this is a piece, um, it's the very opening of an episode that's about a 20 something minute long story. And as you can hear, like in the first two and a half minutes of the piece, like you have no idea who you're hearing from, why you're hearing this story. It turns out to be a story that's gonna be about a relationship between a volunteer and um, some, an asylum seeker in the Calais refugee camp. Um, so, but, you know, it's really the, the piece that that's not information that we're giving you yet. And I mean, it's only going to slowly, slowly unfold throughout the piece. And it's kind of a risky thing to start like a piece with such a long, like slow buildup of like, it starts the first 30 seconds are really mundane. Just someone talking about their routine, what they do in the day. You're kind of like, why would I listen to this? Then you start to hear a bit more ominous details, like that, you know, something's a miss here, but you don't know what it is yet. And it's only two and a half minutes in that you, oh, you get the, even the context of what this story is, that it's in this, the Calais camp. And so I, we're always trying to think about like, what information does the listener actually need at the beginning? And how long can we delay certain bits of information so that the listener is wondering where this is going? Cause that's where the interactive element of audio storytelling comes in is where you're just like really getting the listener to kind of like lean forward and wonder like what is not being said what are they not telling me you know there's hints that something isn't being said something's being withheld but you don't know what it is you don't know where it's going so we're always trying to play with that uh, in terms of our pacing of information in the story and it's the same thing with emotion so let's say you have a story that has like many emotional beats to it you know you want to be really careful about how you're gradually like dr like little raindrops are kind of building uh, throughout the story rather than like soaking it and drenching it like right off the top. So it's kind of like withholding emotion as well as information as you go along so that you can kind of create that desire to keep listening and to figure out what's gonna happen next. Yeah, there's an aspect of that piece just re-listening to it that reminds me kind of of when you're on one of those old roller coasters and you're kind of just like, going up the the first big hill or whatever you want to call it and you just hear that like gradual mechanical clicking sound and it's so like there's nothing that exciting happening per se in that lead up but it's it's that build up of tension and then the kind of reveal and I also think um I think of tv and film in the set in in the way that they use television cameras or film cameras to kind of go from soft focus to to sharper focus and kind of point to what is the, the specifics of what is going on and how that that changes the experience depending on how quick those dissolve those dissolves are or, or how slow and um, kind of like going back to what crystal is saying like about thinking of uh, it as a time signature and like you're setting that this is because it's the opening of the piece it's also like you're you're just saying by the way listeners you need to be patient with this story you're not going to get everything right off the top so if that's the mood you're in like reset your expectations this is going to be a 23 minute piece and this is the pace we're going at so like get on board with our pacing it's kind of just like yeah wrenching the listeners into your yeah your pacing and your rhythm all right, so we're going to play another clip from the Suicide Hotline piece. Um, so this is kind of the climax section near the end of the piece. Um, so when you listen, you'll notice that we're, we're kind of starting off in one kind of time signature. So we're in a rhythm that is kind of building up tension. And then all of a sudden that movement stops and then we start back up again really slowly. 
Um, this has a little bit of some sensitive material in it. Um, there's, there's no like real explicit talk uh, about suicide. It's still quite intense. So I just want you to be aware of that um, as, we're, as we're going into this clip. Um, it's about three and a half minutes long. It's no secret that we answered the phone after two rings. And when we present it in training class, I'll go, now I'm gonna tell you exactly what's gonna happen the first time you answer the phone. It's gonna ring once and you're gonna go, oh God, I think I'm gonna throw up. You're gonna take a deep breath. The phone's gonna ring again. Ready or not. You're going to go, Samaritan. Samaritan's going to help you. My third time when I was alone on the phone, that I was no longer in training, there was a woman they called the hotline. Are you suicidal? Do you have a plan? Do you have the means? She, she wanted, she wanted to do it. Her emotions would de-escalate, and then all of a sudden they would go back up in anger and frustration. She had a sick mother in the house. When you have someone you're taking care of, as they get worse, you lose the connection to friends. They can't go out with friends. They can't go. So these are people who need to talk to someone. Don't hang up. Don't hang up. I kept feeling if, I, if she didn't hang up, I could get her help. I just had my head down, just blocking out the whole world, listening to this woman. You know, I was holding my head and I just listening, listening, listening. I was just in that one little world there of, of this phone call, and that was it. It, you don't realize what it's doing to you physically. I mean, the tenseness. We don't volunteer to listen to someone commit suicide. We have an option of our own, whether we stay on the line with someone who's already begun the process. And we are helpless because we have no idea who they are, or where they're calling from. Thirty-eight minutes I listened. I'm going to ask you one more time. Can I call 911 back for you? Can I get you help? Finally, she agreed to me. She said yes. I, 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 I left the phones and, and I went out to my car and I just cried and just cried and cried and cried. All right. So um, I think part of our intention with a lot of our work in, in this piece uh, in particular is that we're trying again, not to just recount something, but to really like get inside of, uh, of an experience. So in this instance, this volunteer is talking about how physically tense it is um, and how she was listening to this person on the other end for 38 minutes. Um, obviously we can't, we can't make the pause 38 minutes. We can't stay in that scene for 38 minutes, but I think it is our job as audio producers and. It, at least in the type of work that we do, that we're trying to translate that experience. And so we're trying to, again, get into that experience. So um, what can I do as an audio maker uh, to kind of relay that experience of tension that she's having? Well, I could play with, with silence and pauses because 
it's really, really uncomfortable as a listener to hear silence um, in, in audio. Um, and so I remember when we were building this piece, we kept adding more and more space. And, and every time we would re-listen to it in context of the whole piece, because that's also important, uh, we kept just like adding more and more space because it, it just, it, it, it needed to kind of reach reach that, that kind of feeling um, that this volunteer had. Um, and she's giving quite a minimal amount of information. She's not saying too, too much. So I think like in a standard storytelling way, like if you would listen to this tape on its own, you wouldn't be like, oh my God, this is amazing tape. It's not super dynamic. It's, 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 uh, it's just conveying information very minimally, but I think by virtue of spacing it out, it kind of elevates the tape and gives it this new quality. And it's almost like it's creating this kind of surreal experience of it. And it's kind of like suspending time. Um, and I think what was interesting about this piece too is that it, it deals a lot with phone calls. And I think it kind of mimics the way the audio medium works also in that there's just like a natural tension that we have when we can't see the other person. Um, and so phone calls, obviously you never know when the other person is gonna respond to you. Um, and so we're kind of just like using those pauses and those that negative space again and just like playing it to our advantage, right? Um, and in this piece, we, we wanted to push that even more because it was a conscious decision that we made at the start to not include voices of the people who are actually calling like examples of people of, of what they were saying so it's all we're putting ourselves all in strictly in the position of the volunteer who's listening for these these signals that they've been taught to listen for um yeah yeah and it's like because we don't have that other audio all of those in each of those pauses you're giving the listener a chance to wonder what is being said on the other end what is what's happening and that's like a silence is, is like literally a blank slate you know so you're the listener is just putting doing the work of filling it in with whatever their imagination can come up with and whatever their whatever might I might uh trigger for them so um yeah it can just be so much richer than like cram it the more space you can leave the more room there is for the person the listener to to imagine what might be happening too so um, so, not, and you can also, this is like obviously a very heavy, heavy example, um, but even in our more comedic or humor work, we still try to use those same approaches of kind of drawing out moments and being really precise with like the pauses and how long, um, how long we're holding silences or delaying information. And so we'll just play another clip to kind of clear the palette of that one. Um, that's also about three minutes. And it's basically the setup, I guess, is that it's um, a, a storyteller, a man named John, who's really looking for love. And he's has all these kind of meet cute moments where he thinks he might be falling, meeting, meeting the one and they all find a fall flat. But then he, he gets to this moment where he's at a McDonald's and he's really about really excited about this. What this potential mo in this moment. And in this one, you'll also hear um, our host, Lou, kind of reacting to it. So it was kind of, he was telling her the story. So you'll hear her voice in it too. All right. And then it happens. I see the hottest guy from across like the McDonald's and he's staring and looking at me and I'm like, it's impossible. And my coworker's like, John, he's looking at you. You have to do something. So I grab my Diet Coke and I'm walking across the room and I'm thinking to myself, like, does McDonald's cater? Because how cute would it be if at our wedding we had food from the first place that we met, like little heart-shaped cheeseburgers and like have different sauces, like barbecue sauce and nuggets. I go over to the soda machine praying, please, please just let him turn around and talk to me. Let him say something, you know what I mean? Like anything. The cup's under the thing and I'm just like, you know, kind of a little bit bopping. Like there's a song in my head, but like there's no music. Just, you know, to show like, hi, I'm fun, I'm flirty. And he turns around and he says, hello. I almost died. Like I almost <laughs> fainted. I'm like, my heart is going fast. And I feel a little bit like lightheaded dizziness because I'm like so excited that this is going to actually happen. I'm like, hi. He puts his hand on my shoulder and no joke, Lou, like I was like, my knees buckled. I was like, oh my God, like he was so handsome. I'm like, what's happening right now? 
and this little old man cuts between us. I could have almost killed that little old man. Really right now, like I'm having a moment here. But you can't break up a connection like this. So he puts his hand back on my shoulder and when I'm nervous, I have to like touch people. So I started stroking his arm mm. and I'm stroking his arm. He's touching my shoulder and he's like, you look good. And I'm like, oh thank you. In my mind, I knew that this was the one for me because, follow me, okay? I had gone to this like tarot card reading woman and she said to me, she's like, John, when you meet the one, you're going to feel like you've known him forever. And that's exactly how I felt. I felt like I knew this person my entire life. He's like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm, I'm here with my coworker. We're having lunch. What are you doing here? And he's like, oh, I'm here waiting for Sandra. She has an interview around here. And I'm like, Sandra? Who's Sandra? As I'm still stroking him, it clicks. The only Sandra I know married one of my cousins, who I hadn't seen in over 12 years. So I'm stroking my cousin in the <gasps> middle of McDonald's. No. Yeah, 100%. Oh my goodness. 100% I'm stroking my cousin. Yeah, that's, I would say, rock bottom. <gasps> and then it happens. So, I mean, John is a great storyteller, naturally but of course there's a lot happening in that moment just in the editing as well and the mixing of course but even just in the pacing of information that's being revealed how it's dragging out this moment of revealing this punchline that it's his cousin and we so we do that by just giving a lot of detail so that's the detail and the heightened amount of detail is what's kind of slowing them down that moment to this awkwardly long, like slow, like you, it, again, like maybe using a movie metaphor, it's like this slow mo mo motion shot where he's like walking across the McDonald's and he's having all these thoughts in his head. So like, but through the editing, like not editing all, out all of those tangents is him, is us like being able to control that extra slow motion effect of like, he's imagining their wedding and he's just like, just dragging it on as much as we can, pushing it to the limit before we're gonna have that reveal. And I mean, it's always like a bit of a balance between like something dragging uh, in an unpleasant way and something being drawn out in a really pleasant way. Um, so, you know, you have to be kind of aware of what what is the reveal going to be? How satisfying is it? And that's going to kind of maybe influence how long you can play with that time, whether it's an emotional reveal or a comedic moment like a punchline. Um, so in this case, he's just so fun to listen to that we were, you know, really stretch it out. And, um, and, you know, it's kind of like you're getting those, all those details are like li little dots being filled in or color being filled in in an image. And you don't, you want to really like make sure that the less listener is not getting ahead of you. Like you're, uh, you're really filling in the outer edges and they're never going to see the full image until you want them to see the full image. So you're kind of just like being in control of how, yeah, how the pacing at which that, that image is getting filled in. Uh, so we, we might play another clip that also illustrates uh, comedic timing, but in a very different way, like rather than drawing something out, it's like squishing it down into an absurdity, absurdly uh, playing with rhythm in a more fast paced kind of way. So this is a piece that we made on wiretap. Well, actually Jonathan Goldstein is the one who edited this piece. So we'll give him the credit. Um, and it's, there's a main, a character on wiretap named Howard and he comes into John's studio. He always barging into John's studio. Uh, and here he, he barges in, in quite a hyper way. Mm. Howard, what, what is that jug that you're drinking from? It's delicious. Hyperquench. It's an energy drink. That's a really big mm. bottle, Howard. How big is that? It's a family size format, two liter jug. I think maybe you should cut down on it. But cut down. It's my first time trying that. I never even had this stuff before. Hyper Hyperquench. There's another commercial. Quench that hyperactivity with Hyperquench. They're super delicious. All different flavors. This one, this one's licorice. It's licorice. It's a licorice flavor. It's delicious. Howard, have you. Wine punch, punchy in the face. It's like I said, it's like a punch in the face. It's fantastic. It's like a... Okay, Howard. Come on, give me anywhere. I can I rhyme it. I want you to just calm down, Howard. Calm, calm, bomb. Look at that. Right off the bat. Bat, cat, sat, fat. Howard, you. Bat, look at that. Bat. You're vibrating. Bat, sat, hibernating. It's a good one. I'm going to write that down. Howard, you're writing it down on my table. Cut that out for me. Maybe photocopy that for me. Give it to me after. I can't photocopy this a great. table, just Howard. Howard give it to me after. Look at you. You're. 
Um, so that, that stress, that the whole piece is really kind of at that relentless pace of just like all the pauses are kind of vacuumed out of the, all of the powers pauses anyways are vacuumed out. So it's just like an unrealistic way. Like you can't, he's not actually talking that fast, even though he's like performing in a really funny fast way, but he's, Jonathan also edited out like almost all the pauses. So he's talking in this inhuman way. I and mean, we might've even sped up some of the, the voice tracks. I don't remember, but um, just to kind of push the comedy to that absurd level, like pushing the boundaries of reality, make just to make you make it funner, funnier. Um, so shall we move along? Do, I, we have one, another clip. I don't know how we're doing for timing though. So maybe we should move along to Maybe we should just move along. Yes. Yeah. So the next clip that we're going to play is uh, is a montage. Um, and so a good example of how you kind of play with different rhythms and kind of try to make them orchestrate them into something. Um, so this is a montage from uh, To My Heart. So this is an episode we produced for Love Me with uh, Sarah Geis. So this is the story of Mansoor Adaifi. Um, Mansoor uh, is an ex-Guantanamo Bay detainee. Um, and so the episode is all about, he shares his experiences there and obviously he experienced a lot of uh, challenges and uh, uh, darkness there uh, and abuse. But there were also these moments of really strong connection that he experienced uh, with the fellow detainees. Um, so he talks about these classes that they used to give each other. So depending on what their backgrounds were, um, they, would, they would say, teach each other uh, cooking classes, like an ex-chef would have would have taught them cooking classes with, obviously they didn't have real ingredients and stuff like that, but they would kind of play play at, at, at cooking. Um, and since a lot of the, the men, when they entered into Guantanamo Bay uh, Detention Center were very young, they, a lot of them had never had romantic experiences before. And so uh, some of the fellow, fellow detainees who were, who were married uh, would teach these marriage classes. Um, and so this, this montage is kind of uh, towards the ending of the piece. It's, it's kind of like this big, kind of cathartic moment. Um, so I'm gonna play that and then we can talk about it after. I remember when, one day in our marriage class, we made a pretend uh, wedding for one of the uh, detainees. Actually, it was a tradi uh, Yemeni tradition uh, wedding. It was like the end of the class, the big, the big day, the wedding day. Then we chose one of, of our brothers. He was a little uh, troublemaker. This guy is going to marry today. We agreed on some wife, like choose one of the brothers to be the, <laughs> the bride. And our brother put the sheet around him and sheet in his head like a Yemeni, like a Yemeni wedding. Today we have a wedding party. We are going to, to cook for 300 people. All kind of people imagine. Teachers, engineers, singers, mafia, soldiers, divers, psychologists, pilots, chefs. Add the tomato. Please test the salt, the meat. Okay, now add the onion to the oil. Shh. <laughs> oh, God, like a delicious food. Real celebration all night long. We sang, we danced on the bed. We start with the Yemeni dancing, moving to the Afghani, back to the Pakistani, back to the Saudi dancing, and brought it together with some moves. It was like a funny dancing. No, no, no. What do you feel? I'm going to heaven. <laughs> it was a lovely moment. It was like you live in hell, but in the hell you find some kind of moment like you never ever forget those moments, even now. All right, so uh, there's lots of different rhythms going on there. So you have like the short and long bits from Mansoor talking, but there's also this music track that is setting like a natural rhythm that you can't mess with. So I think montage is like one of the hardest things to pull off and the, I would, it, it's a type of segment that just takes a lot of time uh, because you're mixing and matching various pieces of tape um, and you want, the person to be saying the right thing, but you're also trying to figure out how to complement the different pieces of tape rhythmically. Um, and in this instance, uh, 
we're also trying to kind of recreate um, an atmosphere of celebration. So the listener is kind of along for this ride as we're moving quickly through these different visuals that Mansoor is setting up for us. So it's kind of a little bit all over the place and we're kind of being jerked around, but it's really, it's kind of in a fun way and in service of the scene that he is trying to communicate. Um, and there's almost like a kind of like delirium to it. Um, and we also just needed, like, I think Mansoor, we needed to give him that break also, like as a storyteller in the piece, because it's all one voice. Uh, so it's all of a certain rhythm and there's a lot of like heavy, heavy, heavy sections. Uh, there's some lighter ones, but I think like it felt good to us in a way to kind of, uh, create like try to recreate what he he had experienced uh in this kind of pretend wedding so again we're trying to not only uh, get somebody to recount their story but we're trying to it's kind of an act of translation like we're trying to uh do it justice as well and so um yeah we could have easily just used tape of him setting up that scene in maybe two sentences or three sentences, but obviously it would not have had the same same effect. And then it kind of hands us off to the ending of the piece, which is a little bit more serious in nature. So uh, it, it kind of like feels good as a listener too, to just like have this, this, this moment of catharsis alongside Mansoor. Yeah, and I think you, like you said in that piece, it's the, the, most of the piece is very like, kind of a slow like steady it's steady it's a steady rhythm and you know you you're always trying to create variation in rhythm throughout a piece so that you're just to, to keep your listeners like attuned and sensitive to what's going on you know if something's too steady it can just become repetitive and like it, you can kind of drift off and in the rhythm of it whereas like just pairing something that's like quick with something slow and just like it kind of keeps you moving and as a listener so and just like that feeling of getting swept up is such a, like a powerful powerful moment in that piece um and so in general you know going back to kind of what we had learned you know as this like this american life kind of uh rule book of like having these like six second breaks throughout a piece um which is something that we still think about just in terms of really giving breathing room in a piece um and we think of it, I guess, as, as a, as digestion, like maybe not to get too gross into like stomach metaphor, but like, um, just the importance of leaving space where there's no voice, no information, either whether it's silence or music, but just something that's not like an intellectual engaging, uh, not words, um, to really allow the, like, make sure that anytime you're trying to build an emotional moment uh, in your piece, like you need to be pairing that with some room for that emotion to be digested. Um, and you can play with that, of course, it's not like one to one ratio, like you can let emotions build and then give it a moment to digest. But if you're never giving those moments in a piece of like breathing room or like digestion room, um, like those emotions are never going to have time to sink in, they're just going to kind of stay at the surface because they're just piling on too fast. And so we're always trying to think about, yeah, those breaks where you can actually, the person can actually absorb and process what they're hearing emotionally. And especially we, that's kind of almost, I mean, it's important throughout a piece, but it's also really important at the end of the piece. And, uh, you know, often we think of the piece is finished and it's finished and that's that, but like the, the, the minute or the few 30 seconds or whatever you can spare, if you're in a, if you're making a podcast, you know, hopefully you have plenty of time before your post roll is going to come in, but like, you know, you can play with the time after a piece and really think of it as part of the piece itself itself. It's like where, where everything you've experienced throughout the piece is kind of landing and coming together in the listener. And so um, we're trying, we always like try to listen to the, uh, an episode from the beginning of a piece to the end in order to really determine exactly like how long those breaks should be between pieces or how long a musical tale should be at the end of a piece so that it doesn't feel like there's a new thing coming in and interrupting that digestion. So we just wanted to play um, the last three and a half minutes of one piece that we made in an episode in an episode called The Detonator. And this piece was also made with Sarah Geis and with um, an anonymous storyteller. And um, it's the end of a piece. It's a woman who's been telling the story of basically being 
uh, harassed online by uh, an acquaintance of hers um, that she met in college. And uh, so we'll play a long chunk. It kind of include, incorporates, I guess, a lot of things we've been talking about it. There's like a montage, there's rhythm, there's pauses, and we'll let it play out at the end in terms of the musical tale that we would have left before another piece uh, comes in after. 2015. You can love me again. I have his emails automatically forwarded to a separate account so that I don't have to see them. Shame on you. Shame on you. I get a friend to read them sometimes, to check for threats to my family. Even if I'm speaking to a brick wall, I need to use my voice. By now, I've spent thousands of dollars on lawyers' fees. I'm going to keep writing until you say something nice to me. 2016. I want you to have my baby. I try to go on dates. If I marry you, I do laundry. Some will say I'm married beneath me. I clean the house. Love cannot be extracted like a tooth. I get bangs. You were wrong, pumpkin. I eat breakfast. I had spicy potatoes for breakfast. I call my mom. How could you hurt a man that sent you nice songs? I move apartments. Hope you enjoyed your Christmas gift, jerk. I get sick. I think you're a spoiled child. I get you're well again. Lost. I'll stop bothering you. I buy groceries. I'm going to keep writing until I go to the you say library. something nice to me. You were wrong, pumpkin. 2017. Nice I'll stop I find a job that I love. But I don't think he knows about. And I meet someone. I grow out my hair. Excuse me while I go jump off a bridge. Sometimes I almost forget that he is lurking in the background. Women say, I don't need a man. Almost. Then they grow bitter and don't age well. 2018. Yesterday. A canvasser stops me on the street, asking for signatures against animal cruelty. I say sure, but change my mind when I have to fill in my address on the form. Why are you being so precious about privacy? The kid asks me. I want to explode on him, to reveal a history of violation and pain but how would I even start? Would I shout, he is a tumor. I am an organ adjusting. He is a bear trap and I am learning to walk with three legs. He is a magnifying glass. I am an insect burning. He is an arrow. I am his target. He is a parasite. I am his host. Instead, I just say, I have a stalker. I have a stalker. And the kid stares at me for a minute, then turns to the next passerby as I walk away. So that's kind of where the next piece would have come in. I guess we could have chose a clip that had <laughs> continued on, but um, so basically like the piece is pretty, there's a lot going on in that piece. It's like an 11 or 12 minute piece. And uh, it's not all as busy as that last montage. It's a lot steadier, but there's still like these two voices happening. And throughout the piece, this woman is kind of wrestling with the language of how to name her experience because it's so complicated and layered. And also she tries to report this stalking to the police and they just, they don't understand. And they, there's just not, the word stalker just seems so slight and so like innocent almost. Like it just doesn't capture the actual like torment that she's enduring and how deeply it's impacting her health and her life and her mental health and everything. So 
this piece culminates in this like intense rhythm of uh, this montage and just like the accumulation, the passing of time of how long this stalking is going on. And then it kind of like really just like closes into this like really quiet silence where she brings you back to the present day. And there's quite a lot of like quite long pauses there. And especially when she finally like, it's the first time in the piece where she uses that word stalker and she just says it out loud. And, you know, we're just always being really cautious about how we're like, sort of it's kind of I guess if you almost think of it like a picture frame in a museum or something it's like the space around the pictures or the art on the walls is like really having an impact on how you're seeing each thing if you just put everything really cluttered together you know you're not going to be able to appreciate things in a different way or it has a just totally different effect but so just like using pausing to surround like an important moment or word to and clear it and just give it that breathing space um, for it to really have power and again, with it, similarly with the end of the piece, not crowding it with some new piece coming in where you have to like feel this intense thing and then move on. And all of a sudden you're trying to be, you're asking someone to think about something else and like this new story or this new piece or the credits or whatever you're coming in with, just like really being considerate, I guess, of, of your listener and this emotional experience that they've just gone through for the first time and how sometimes that can, it can be intense. It can raise, you know, intense emotions in someone. So giving them the time to digest that and to like experience that, enjoy it, whatever the emotion is um, before asking them to shift their focus onto something else. Yeah, so similarly to what we talked about in the, the first clip that we played in that the opening of the suicide hotline piece was really kind of setting the time signature at which you're entering into a piece. You're equally trying to uh, communicate to the listener that they should be slowing down and that we are kind of exiting the piece as well. Um, there's also a lot of nice stuff in that montage about like how to represent the passing of time itself. Like I feel like uh, Mira Sound designed this piece and it's uh, it's really beautiful. And it just, just the way the kind of voices come in and out and there's a kind of constant um, kind of beat almost that's happening in the background. There's a music track there, but then the kind of voice of the stalker is coming in and out uh at various moments and it's kind of hard to detect rhythmically what's going on but it kind of really gets at that insidious nature of having somebody constantly in the background of your life like that um and also like there's there's a, some nice space like in the reverb and stuff like that and so it really does kind of feel like you're communicating the passage of time like these years are passing by and it's kind of again playing with that tension in the space um and the pacing of it all um, and it kind of like fully communicates like the, the kind of horror or um, dread of the whole thing. Um, yeah. Um, do we have anything else? I think we're kind of wrapping up here. Um, should we take questions? Yeah, I guess we could have said at the beginning that, you know, yeah, we were going to talk and then it's up to you now to ask questions if you want. Um, so we can see you typing. Uh, if you type in any questions, um, we can answer them. There might be a delay in the stream. So this is me vamping and talking in case there's a delay and there's no questions yet. Um, I guess we yeah, can just to go, yeah. Yes, I can just, just to go back to um, the idea of endings and stuff like that, like something we do often uh, in our endings to kind of communicate that it's or to make it something feel more endy is really kind of splitting up what the person is saying to kind of, again, communicate that it's slowing down. So sometimes we won't have the greatest tape from somebody like for an ending, but I think like the, if we edit it uh, really spaced out, it kind of like gives it an extra weight to kind of uh, land, stick the landing, I guess you could say. Um, and then, yeah, so just thinking about trends in, in podcasting nowadays, like this is something that is kind of a pet peeve of mine um, that happens more with narrated podcasts, I would say, or narrated shows where, uh, Mira, you already mentioned this, but where you kind of have this really intense story and then the host um, just like comes in and kind of tramples all over like that, that feeling that you had. And I feel like it's kind of almost like you've just done this like really intense workout or something and but you just don't bother to cool down and you just like walk away from all this cardio and your muscles are kind of like hurting and not really you're not really fully getting the benefits of of 
the experience. Um, but I do recently, like I've heard a few things that really, I thought really did it well. Um, the other Latif, I thought um, the ending of the series, I think maybe it was a six episode series. Um, I counted and they left about a minute and a half of music at the very end. And I, I remember when I was listening to it on the street in my headphones, I like, had to rewind and I wanted to count like how much actual music they left because it's I feel like it's so rare to actually leave space before credits or stuff like that and I felt like that did it such justice um mm -hmm. and also uh floodlines does that really really well too they play with they, they play with space very very beautifully um and um, yeah so we have a couple questions coming in um there one from Brett. Um, how do you keep your ears fresh when you're listening to something for the umpteenth time to check for pacing all the way through? Yeah, that's really tricky. Um, I think it's partly about stepping back and if, if you have the luxury of time um, to be able to like actually not listen to the piece for a few days and come back to it where it's you can try to convince yourself that you forget what the piece is, although it's like, so ingrained in you by the time you're at that final stage of editing. Um, so, and yeah, we'll always listen. I think we said, but like we'll, when we're trying to think about really about like pacing, we'll try to listen from the beginning. Like when you, when you just listen to a chunk, even if it's like a 10 minute chunk, chunk of a longer piece in isolation, like the timing is so different than if you've actually listened from the beginning. So we're always trying to like make sure we're really rewinding and really listening from the start to the end. Yeah, like time has, it, it feels like it almost has a different property depending on whether you're listening to just like that micro section of a piece versus listening to it as a whole. And I think that's something that when we re-listen to older pieces that we've done, um, I almost always feel like they move too quickly. They're never, they're never ever too slow. It's always too quickly. So I don't know, there's something that happens to time um, as you kind of move, zoom away from, from what you're working on. Um, yeah. Um, there's another interesting question from someone who said that says, do you have a line about what's too far in terms of moving lines of dialogue around to suit your story needs, which I think is really interesting uh, to talk about because we're not neither of us are really come from a journalistic background. Um, and I think it obviously depends on the context of the piece that you're doing. If you're doing more of a straightforward reported story, you know, there could be ethical issues with how you're playing with someone's dialogue, um, cutting it up or stretching it out. But because we're doing documentary work that's um, that that has a definition of documentary, I guess, as like an as an art form and as an act of creation, like it's not reporting um, just some, what, what happened, but it's really creating an experience and an emotional experience. Um, so we are quite loose with like how we'll add pauses or move, pause things out. Of course we have our own maybe internal like logic about it. And maybe there's lines that we might not cross depending on ex the specifics, but it's, I think in general, you know, for example, in like the, the stalker piece or in the, like the suicide hotline piece we played, like, if we're, tr we're really trying to create the experience that the person is recounting. So that person might talk, say, say, say reveal the information or say it a lot faster, but that's not actually capturing what they're describing or what that, what happened to them. So we're trying to like, we're not just documenting like what the person is saying and then giving that to you as a listener. We're trying to get back to the moment they're actually talking about it and recreating that feeling so sometimes you do need to really morph what's actually being said to get to a more accurate or more true like version of what happened. So it's maybe about not understanding like the truth or accuracy of like the recording so much as like the experience that it's describing. And of course it's like, there's a lot of gray, um, but in, 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 within that. And we're, but we're always trying to also be respectful to the storyteller and create something that we think best, you know, represents their experience without like, co-opting it for some other purposes yeah and we try to keep uh, we usually ask for feedback of, of a storyteller that we've worked with or we just try to get a sense of how they um their experience of of this being involved in this kind of storytelling was and we've never ever had any negative feedback really so um i think uh, as long as, yeah, we're trying to get to like the emotional truth of what somebody is saying and not being disrespectful and not 
kind of use it for manipulative purposes. Um, like, I think the context obviously matters a lot. And um, I mean, technically at CBC, I guess we would be under the banner of entertainment, I suppose. Um, so that just means like that on a factual level, we're, we're not bound to uh, the same kinds of journalistic principles that um, say like a current affairs or investigative podcast would be. Um, and we have some more questions. Keep them coming. Thanks, everyone. Um, there's any advice on setting a scene with audio without the obvious sound effects? Crystal, the mixing queen, let's let her handle this one. <laughs> well, that's tough because it all depends on context, right? So I would say that I'm always trying to draw my cues or... Um, uh, ideas from the content itself. So obviously uh, with a story like the suicide prevention hotline, it's all based on the phone. So of course I'm going to use phone ringing sounds. Of course I'm going to use phone static. Um, there are just certain stories that just lend themselves better than others also to, um, to sound cues. Um, there's also a difference between using like literal sound versus metaphoric sound. So um, sometimes it's a dance between like using very sparse sound effects that kind of literally represent what is happening or, or try to like uh, get into more of a documentary space where you're kind of setting a scene and it's like, oh, if you're in a bar, then you're kind of going to bring in some ambi of a bar in the background. You're going to hear voices uh, and crowd sounds. Uh, but then there's also metaphoric sound, which is like using that same bar sound and maybe adding a little bit of reverb to, to push it into more of a memory space or to kind of communi communicate something more emotionally. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that really helps. It's, uh, it, it really depends on, on the content of the piece itself. Um, yeah. Maybe on that, like uh, a similar topic is what are do we have rules on timing or is it all intuition I mean I guess these things that we've been talking about are, yeah it's kind of they're just ideas and that we try to think about but most of it it does seem to be kind of it's kind of a gut feeling and it's kind of intuitive as we're as we're editing and to pair that with this other question that someone asked like do you construct episodes by writing like working from transcripts or do we do it all in the audio editing and I think with pacing, like we do sometimes work from transcripts um, to some degree, like it's really useful to have a transcript when you do want to be doing like fine editing and, and construction. But like is there's something that just doesn't translate from a paper edit to like an actual audio session. So we, we kind of do like an outline, I guess, more on paper with the transcripts just to kind of get started. But it's more of an intuitive, like we try to work get pretty quickly to work and write it with the audio because it's so like just the pacing of how someone's delivering each sentence like it just doesn't translate on, onto the paper so um yeah it seems like a, a, for me anyways at least I feel like it's a pretty much like mostly intuition and I, I don't know if Crystal you want to add to that but um yeah I would probably echo the same thing um like a lot of those rules I feel like they're so internalized now that I feel like and we both, I think, like have similar types of internalized rhythms where we uh, like, you know, people just develop their styles. And I think uh, you can tell by listening to like a love me piece that it's like, oh, like that's Mira or Crystal, like because you could hear the way um, the pace is, is working. Um, I think also like depends to um, I think we both have a bit of a musical background, which I think helps. Um, like there's just, uh, you studied piano and I come from a musical family as well. So I think there's just like a natural pace of things that, that go hand in hand with music and stuff like that as well. Um, and we also do do a lot of music editing. So the tracks that we use to score um, our stories are very, very heavily manipulated. So we're cutting, we're cutting out bridges, we're cutting out uh, we're making loops, we're copy pasting different parts of the music track to make it fit the rhythm that we want. So we didn't really talk about music so much, um, but definitely that's a huge uh, layer of rhythm too in our work. 
Yeah, and a couple of people have asked about music, and unfortunately, we don't create music when we or we just we don't have the budget for a composer, and we're not really we're not composers. So we work with the sound library um, that CBC with APM music that usually that CBC has access to when we're doing a CBC project anyway. So there are limits definitely to what we can do with music, but we've kind of accumulated a library of stuff that we like well enough from that within that system uh, over the years. Um, someone's also asking, how do we work together as a team? Like which of you does what? Um, so it's, I guess it depends on the piece. We kind of uh, flip back and forth from different roles on a very broad way. Maybe Crystal ends up doing more mixing and I end up doing more story editing, but it's, we we kind of pass those roles around depending on the piece. Uh, if one of us is editing, like uh, physically cutting the tape and mixing a piece, the other one will become more of a story editor, giving feedback, being those fresh ears that come in and listen. Um, so yeah, we kind of do, we, and even when we're doing one of those roles on a piece, like we're, we're so like invested in each, <laughs> we're so like, cause they're both such so controlling about every detail of a piece that like, if Crystal's mixing, I'll still be like, okay, add more pause here or like louder here. And if I'm mixing vice versa and you know, we really get all up in each other's business about everything. Um, what other questions are here? Um, do, oh, oh yeah, this was a good one. Do we ever feel like we've gotten into a stylistic rut relying on the same tricks over and over? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's really tough because like I was just saying, uh, you get into these patterns and you kind of like internalize or just, just stuff becomes intuition and then you stop questioning it. I think like we kind of, um, I think we kind of experiment still though. I would like to think so. I feel like in our last season of Love Me especially, we kind of maybe broke out of some of those rhythms. Um, and again, it, it all depends on on the piece itself and what the piece is giving you like sometimes like a piece just needs to move in a very straightforward standard way so we're just gonna you know rely on those um rules that we learned from you know john and this american life uh, but some other stuff like really kind of demands a bit more um stepping out of our comfort zones i guess but definitely for sure it's hard to it's hard to not establish a formula um, okay, what else are we got here? Did I, is someone, I, did I miss anyone's question in this list? Um, how do we keep our ears fresh? Yes, we did that, yes. Um, mm, 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 mm. We did that, we did that, we did that. What is your, the order of the steps you take when making an episode? Does working out the pacing always come at the same time in the process? That's interesting. Um, I think I would say that it's always kind of part of the edit. Like if we'll start on just strictly editing, like if we do the, all the recordings and stuff like that, then we'll start on the rough editing of just the voice and we won't start mixing or anything like that. But I think like even from that point, we're still roughly spacing things out so that we can kind of get a sense of how the story is gonna move. But then I would say like the further and further we get along into the process, like once we get close to being done, like almost, I would say all of our notes are about like, oh no, like half second more pause here or like uh, half beat more there or two beats more there. And it's it's pretty much like all this fine tuning that comes in at the end. And it's, uh, we spend like a lot of time on it towards the end, I would say most of all. Mm -hmm. And I guess the nice thing, yeah, about working in a podcast is like when we when we produced Wired, we were producing Wiretap with Jonathan. And it's like, you know, we had a 27 and a half minute slot to fill. And so that's obviously going to influence your pacing a lot. You can't always stretch things as much as you want to. Or sometimes you have to fill two minutes. And so you really have to <laughs> actually stretch something out way longer than it should be just to fill the time. Um, but yeah, we try to try to have a sense of like, what what each piece what the essence of each piece is and what what it's most natural 
length is somehow, I guess. I don't know what the, what, what are, what are the emotional, what's the emotional journey that the listener is going on? How long should it be like before it gets boring or, uh, and in order to explore all the layers of it too. So it's not too short where you're like missing all of this color or detail, but not too long where you're getting bored, I guess. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. Um, we can answer more or we can move on with the day, whatever people like. <laughs> um, we can add, definitely someone's asking if we can add, you know, links to all the pieces we played. We, we, we can do that. We can put them in the comments or however that's gonna work. Um, I don't know if, uh, if we should call it or call it a wrap. Yeah, maybe we'll let uh, Martin come back on and just uh, preview to what's ahead in the series. Thank you so much, Martin, for having us on. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who are who have been listening and tweeting, texting, questioning. Great. Thanks very much, both. Thanks everyone for turning up, asking lots of brilliant questions. Um, we've got one more session next week with Adrienne Lilly and Olivia Bradley Skill. Have I said anything right? Um, uh, the session is it's got a great title, and I'm going to have to remind myself what it is because I don't want to get it wrong. It is stories are good, but do you need them? Uh, so tune in for that, and then we're going to take a little break over the summer um, uh, because I think some people are unlocking down and probably doing fun things with their with the Saturday evenings. So um, well, thanks very much if you have come along to do fun things here with us on your, with your Saturday evenings. And thanks again to Crystal and Mira. Uh, this video, I'll put this up um, uh, 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 on the on the podcast Maker Weekend page, which is where this is hosted at the moment. And you can see all the other videos there. If people, people are asking about previous streams, they can do that. Um, yeah, cool. And, uh, it, uh, and we'll, uh, I can put this in the descriptions um, to, to those uh, little audio clips that we heard throughout the episode. Cool, thanks very much.